Hey guys, Tammy Trier, TrierWilderness.com. We are live here in the She Cave. Can you hold that a second? Okay, I'm going to this around and put this on here. Okay, let's see here. Okay, we are live. We are here. We are going to wait a little bit here for you guys to start popping in. Um, my name is Tammy Trier. This is my mountain man, Glenn Trier. We are from TrierWilderness.com, and we live 100% off-grid with solar power in northern Idaho. And for those of you that follow us on our page, you know that this week has been an absolutely insane and very crazy week for us. So we would like to share a little bit of the adventures with you, especially since all of you were praying so steadfast for us and really offered your support and love to us. So we really appreciate that. <laughs> It was definitely an overwhelming time, <laughs> but um, I see a bunch of you are on. If you want to uh, share with us where you're from and uh, just feel free to ask questions as we go through this. We'll answer the questions at the end, but you can communicate with us in the comments below the video, so feel free to do that with us and communicate with us. We'd love to chat with you. but. Um, Hi, Jared. Good to see you. <laughs> um, yes, he's alive and well, as you can see. Uh, for I those haven't found a way to kill me yet. <laughs> for those of you that are joining us, if you didn't follow us this week, um, the mountain man went out hunting. I'll just paint a little picture for you. He left the house at 6.30 on Monday morning with his father to go out hunting. Uh, they were taking the canoe, and they were floating a local river. It was a, a new section of river for them, and uh, they were planning to elk hunt from the canoe. So thank you for the love, and thank you guys for joining us. And uh, I know his expertise. I never once doubted his abilities in the wild. He is amazing. His skills are amazing. He's been many place in, places and done a lot of things. So his abilities were never in question. But when you're in that situation and you have that um, nagging thing on the other shoulder haunting you as to whether they possibly have been injured, you know, that's a whole other ball game. And he always says to me, or has always in the past said to me, I don't think he will anymore, that I'm supposed to wait three days if he doesn't return home. And I'm sorry, I don't have the ability to do that, regardless if that's what he wants from me or not. I try to be a good wife and listen, but that's not something that I'm willing to do because if I could save his life I'm gonna so I gave him till 8 o'clock it was dark okay so they're not home yet maybe they got something midnight rolls around that's not a comfortable feeling although I figured if anything knowing him he was probably already in bed he was probably sleeping with a fire and was in good shape you know and and taking care of himself but at midnight I headed out and there's a section of road that drives up along the river where they were that I could see river in certain areas so I was looking for headlamps or fire any signs of life out there and was out till 3 a.m. looking for them and couldn't find anything couldn't see anything couldn't hear anything so I didn't want to dial 911 because the major part of me felt that he was okay I had peace that he was okay but I didn't want to let it go because I wanted to find out what the protocols are out here for search and rescue and that type of thing. So I did talk to a deputy and you know he filled me in that they need to wait 12 hours before they will go out looking for victims. So we needed to kind of just rest on that. Uh, an incident was filed so at least that way if we did need to do something it was already started because I didn't want to wait till it was dark again on Tuesday because then they wouldn't search again. So we went out, and in the morning on Tuesday, 7 o'clock, we were in town and, and talking to the deputies again, and they started driving me up and down along the river so we could see if there was any sign of them on the river. And another friend of ours went out on his own on a, on a quad looking for them. So that's the picture I'm going to paint for you. They were, they were gone. I was pretty confident that they were okay, but there's that nagging as to whether they are injured and laying somewhere. So I'm going to turn this over to my mountain man and let him share their adventure and what they experienced and what, what they were doing 
um, so that you can get an idea. And we wanted to share that with you since you guys were praying so steadily and sharing your support with us. So go ahead and tell them, you know, what your experience was like and what, what you were doing, what, what you ran into. Well, the experience was, for me, it was no big deal. I mean, it, it, it just, another time out in the mountains, but, um, I was kind of thinking, you know, for her, not knowing if we were hurt or not, um, same goes for my mother, you know, not knowing, she wouldn't know if we were hurt or not, and just kind of wondering there, um, it was, what happened was, is we were, there was about 14, 15 miles to the section that we were going to go, and like she said, I'd never been in that section before, and, um, it was a section, a river that, it ended up getting a lot of neck downs places, rock walls on either side, and deep swift water, which I've been in that kind of some of that stuff before. Um, that wasn't the problem. The problem was is there was a lot of rocks mixed in with that. And when I say a lot of rocks, I mean an extreme amount of rocks. So the water was still deep, but you were, wasn't deep enough that you could go over top of a lot of the rocks. So a lot of the time I was dragging the canoe behind. Um, we were probably not quite halfway when it got dark on us. Um, so we ended up taking and um, pulling the boat up onto the shore and decided, well, we need to try and get out of here. And just leave the boat come back later and get the boat well things got the rock faces and stuff and it kind of got mixed up there so we couldn't get back down there was a railroad track ran through um, and we were going to try and get on that track but we ran in when we were coming along the one wall uh, the one hill there we ran into some real steep rocks and stuff and couldn't get around to the tracks so we were going to go up and go over and come drop down the other side and we got up on top and it ended up sorry it ended up um <laughs> that we got up on top and we fared well we'll hike up to the mountain see if we could get cell service up on top and couldn't get cell service um nothing we had we had absolutely nothing so we come back down the mountain which was i think we ended up hiking about uh it was about four i think it was about four miles we hiked up across there um figured well at this point she's probably gonna have <laughs> got a hold of somebody in search and rescue and stuff um at least gave them i knew they had protocol it had to follow as far as time period um, that it has to go before they go out and search. And I figured it would be, excuse me, figured it would be daylight before, you know, they're not going to go busting out in the in the dark because don't know what you're going to find. Um, so we ended up setting up camp, um, which like I said, I've done that a million Mitch. times before. <laughs> and just set up camp and uh, waited till morning. Um, God answered some prayers as far as keeping the rain away because here at the house it rained like crazy and in was, town it rained like crazy. It was dumping. So, but there where we were at it uh, it drizzled a little bit and stuff but I had the shelter set up and, and that so it wasn't a, a big you know big deal. Um, morning came and we got packed back up and down went to the one section where we could see down over and found where the tracks came around the rock face and stuff and then we headed down over my father went out while I was gathering stuff up and he uh, he went out and checked how the best way to go down would be and then uh, we headed out and down across and 
headed out the railroad tracks, and then, um, no, we went, it was probably about two miles, something like that, and, uh, here comes my friend, <laughs> um, he come driving up, and thanks, Ryan, if Yeah. You see this by chance. Big time. <laughs> um, he come up, he had left that morning, and Tammy had got a hold of them, and told them what was going on, so he... First thing in the morning, he busted out of there and come, come down through. He figured he'd run the river up, up through, and the tracks and see if he could, you know, see anything. Canoe flipped, whatever. And uh, he came up through, and we were walking down through, and he, he found us and took us back to the house. And I have to thank Carrie for making us a good breakfast and hot <laughs> chocolate and all that good stuff so um yeah it was it was interesting you know it's, like i said the part that wasn't you know wasn't a big deal was you know me being out there it was more right. the part i was concerned what she was going through wondering <laughs> if i was hurt you know if right. dad was hurt whatever um you know just wondering and not knowing um that's why we had tried calling and uh, at least let them know, because I knew if we could get a hold of them, say, hey, everything's all right. We just ran into some struggles in the river and, and that, and she'd be fine. You know, no big deal, you know, with me staying out there. Absolutely. But it was just the idea of <laughs> the me unknown. being hurt. So, yeah. Well, on the night before when I was driving along the river, I even said to him, I said, I would have just been happy if I had come across them down off the, the road I was on. And he said, woman, just go home. I'm fine. And I would have gone home and been completely content and able to sleep. But it's just that unknown. And like I said, I know that he is fully capable of handling himself. And I wouldn't have a problem if he was out there for five days straight. I know he could take care of himself. But that unknown is something that's really lays heavy on you and one of the things that's really important for us and should be for all of you is that you have a protocol in place because when he leaves this house I know where he's at without any question I know the vicinity mm -hmm. I know where to find him I know where to start looking I mean I knew what section of river he was on I knew where he started I knew where he was gonna end and you know, the unknown for me a little bit that was hard was because I had never traveled that area either. We had walked a portion of the tracks but never had followed the whole thing, which was something we had hoped to do this summer and I wasn't well enough. So not knowing what he was running into, not knowing that terrain well enough was a little nerving too. But um, but to know where your your family is, to know where you're you know, where, where they're at, where they plan to be, knowing the area, knowing how to get to them, and knowing that to be able to get people, other people involved in getting them to them is huge. And there's so many people that leave the house and don't share that information, and then there's a total unknown. I mean, where do you even begin to search? So that's something that you should all have in place. You know, you, you don't want to just go out. I mean, I mean, if you don't care about each other, hey, whatever. Help yourself, but um, you know, if, if you care about somebody, set up a plan. You know, we were supposed to. We left. She knew, like she said, where we were gonna park at and where we we're gonna put in at, and where we were gonna end up at. You know, um, have set some kind of a plan in motion before, mm -hmm. and have have a have a plan of what to do if something happens you know like with us we didn't show up have have a plan in place to know okay well they're not back okay we got to start doing this this and this and um have a b plan a b c and d you know you know it, it just plan after plan backup plan backup plan um because it, it, it's not going to hurt to have them plans i mean right. wh what's it going to hurt you to to have an idea of what you're going to do in a situation, you know. Right. We've got a lot of people joining us. Brian Wetzel's on here. Christy's on here. Hey, man. Christy's on here. Hey. Jared has just asked us a question, which I yeah. think is a really good question and something we have definitely mauled over. Do you all think you'll do anything different in the future for emergency communications, something like a handheld ham radio or, a complex, or as complex as a GPS device? Um, you feel that? We, uh, yeah, probably we were going to get, uh, probably get to spots. Um, it's, uh, I'm not even sure what all they involve. 
um, but I do know that you can send out messages via, I think, satellite, satellite yeah. and um, just kind of say, hey, I'm alive. You know, we're okay. Yeah. You know, it's just something, that, it's not something that you, I don't think, you know, you don't message back and forth and no. stuff like that. It's just something, short messages saying, yes, I'm okay, yeah. need help. Um, you know, and then it also has your coordinates on it, right. you know, so they can send help if you need help. So right. that would be, that would be one thing that we're going to get. Yeah, because we're frugal and, you know, typically we're out together or, and, and the woods plays a whole different ball game. Like when he's in the woods, I could go to him and look for him. The water played a whole different role and it added a whole, a, a whole other level of, um, variables things that could have happened boat could have flipped you know they you know they could have got injured they could have drowned i mean there's so many other things that when roll through your mind yeah. so when you're messing with water yeah it's a it's a whole different uh, ball game you know um there's a lot of variables that can come in into play there you know what kind of water she's going to hit it i know <laughs> our, our rhodesian job. ridgeback is just there we go okay okay um so the water plays a whole different ball game in you know compared to being out in the in the woods somewhere um you know pulling the boat and stuff there was a couple times I you know, the rocks were slick and I had not had been excuse me had I not had a hold of the boat good um I did I did went under you know um because I was dragging over some rocks, but in between the rocks, it was pretty deep water and that. So it, it was, you know, it's, it's a whole different ball game. Yeah. I mean, there was a couple times too where I went in between two rocks and I kind of pushed my ankle to the side. I mean, I very easily could have, you know, broke broken an ankle or yeah. something like that. So it's a it's a whole different ball game when you're messing with water. Yeah. And if you don't know how in fast moving water how to do things and how to work Amazing. a canoe and stuff the problem wasn't like i said so much fast water is the rocks that were sticking out because if you go down through there and you hit a rock that's sticking out you know and doesn't even have to be above the water just enough to catch your boat and spins you around in there you're in trouble you know i mean you can especially in fast moving water um you get you get in trouble fast um one thing is my father to give us some little bit of weight out of the boat he was hiking the shore and going up over the rock faces and around and stuff so one thing i'd probably recommend to taking that i would have taken to is um radios that way we could have communicated back and forth um with each other saying hey you know where are you at are you still up on top because we were relying on visual contact um you know i'd see him up on the top of the rock faces and stuff like that well some of the time i couldn't see him he couldn't see me so if we'd had radios <laughs> um you know we could have communicated with each other um and you know and say hey yeah i'm okay because there was times there when my dad was, I didn't see him for, you know, 20 minutes, half hour, you know, even longer, you know, 45 minutes sometimes. So, to not know if he was okay and him not knowing if I was okay, you know, it would have been good to have some radios there. Why don't you share with them all the gear that you packed? Because this is important. One thing, that was one of the reasons I was very confident in him. And, and when I talked to the deputy... You know, he asked me his abilities. I'm like, he could last five days with just the contents of his pants pockets on a normal day. So, you know, the gear he took, they both and had... Let me reiterate on that. Because, because of his knowledge. Uh, yeah, but what, I, what, what I'm saying with that is you could survive with that. That's not necessarily saying you're going to be comfortable. Right. And you're going to be, right. um, you know, it's going to be all oh, just great and all that. <laughs> You know, it's not, no. but you could survive for that right. long. Surviving Exist. and, yeah, and existing are 
two different things. Right, right. But he took, they had, he had his pack, he had, they each had waterproof bags with gear in it. It was raining when they left, they put rain gear on, they had long underwear, they had their camo on underneath that. They also grabbed two extra sets of clothes when they left, so I knew they had it, it, enough, and, and it got warm. So, I mean, I was envisioning them in the canoe in their long underwear at one point in the day because it was so warm. You know, so I knew they had plenty of, and, and even at midnight and 3 a.m., it was 51 and 53 degrees, so it wasn't like it was down in the 30s or sub-temps or anything, but my concern was that you wouldn't be able to have a fire because of how hard it was raining here. I mean, it was just dumping, and keeping a fire going is hard when it's raining like that, and, and it's been raining here for the last two weeks, so everything's wet, and I know he can find dry tinder and dry wood and everything else, but keeping it going was my concern, and I was just concerned they might get hypothermia even though it was warmer, but I know he's good, so, but what did you have with you? Well, I, I had a lot more than what I would normally carry with me if I was out, you know, just hunting. Um, because I was on the river, and that water element throws in a whole different thing, um, I had more than what I normally would carry. Um, what I normally would carry is um, like a some kind of stainless steel container that I could boil water in, and that was that was important. Um, that ended up being pretty important in that situation because we did end up a couple times boiling water, um, so we had fresh water to drink. Um, so I had that. I had um, Kershaw folding saw. I also had a Wyoming pack saw. Um, Space, reusable space blanket um, and this is stuff that I normally would carry uh, knives couple different knives um, fire guaranteed yeah guaranteed fire starter um, either some kind of um, like we have some of the uh, the things from Dave Canterbury uh, the um, mini infernos um, have some of them that's pretty much guaranteed I mean that is guaranteed fire and I have a bunch of lighters um uh, let's see what else yeah, do we'll, I have wool blanket no I don't normally oh, not carry normally. that that's what I'm saying I'm norm what I normally would carry right. would you have any um food? I had some candy bars and stuff but we had taken a lunch along and we didn't eat all our lunch because we were trying to keep moving we sat down for a second and ate lunch just a sandwich and some other stuff and then just take off again um so we had some food left over but we had some oh uh, apples and candy bars uh let's see we had uh some little bag of chips corn chips and um almonds and stuff like that so we had you know we had some food you just kind of rationed it but um back to what i was saying as far as what I normally carried um I had a little bit of food in there was what I would normally carry um I'm trying to think light flashlight extra batteries um bandana you know that that sort of survival stuff um and then what extra I carried with us in the boat was um I had um some Oh, I have it in my normal carry too. Is several 55-gallon drum liners, um, plastic bags, heavy-duty plastic bags. Um, but I had some of them in my uh, other kit that I carried in the boat, and that was in a waterproof bag, one of those float bags. Um, had trash bags, had wool blanket, had um, several sets of clothes, dry clothes extra socks, you know, um, different hats, uh, some medical stuff, um, and that's where we had our food, our extra food and stuff was stuffed in there. Um, yeah, I think that was pretty much what I had thrown in for that, and then that bag too also had um, fire starting stuff in it too, guaranteed fire. Uh, lighters and, and fire cubes, wet, wet fire cubes and that sort of thing. Um, what I did with that, kind of an idea for somebody if if you're going out into some water and stuff, is as long as it's not like 
extremely deep. But I took and tied off to my bag, I tied off, it's about 15 foot of uh, mule tape from the boat to the bag. That way if the boat tipped, the bag would come out and float to the top. If the boat sank, we'd at least have, we could swim out, get the bag, come back, and we'd have dry clothes, guaranteed fire, you know, all that stuff. So, you know, you, you, just a little idea there that you want to be able to have that stuff because if that had come out of the canoe and you say you tipped it and came out and it started floating down the river well then you're swimming trying to get to the the bank and then you got to go after your bag and hopefully you know it ends up on the shore somewhere well who knows where that'll end up and some of them places you know there's rock faces and that and it's not going to end up you'd have to get around them until you got to it it'd be long gone Right. So right. It, that way it stayed with the with the boat. So it's thinking of all those things when you go out into the wild. You know, you really gotta you you can't just think of just the moment. You gotta think ahead of all those things that could be variables, and that is something we normally do. So it was just the unknowns that were really hard. Something along, you know, uh, some I've had people in the past tell me like wow, that's an awful lot of gear, you know, to carry with you all the time and stuff like that. And, yeah, okay, well, something like that happens. It's nice having all that gear with you. you that's know? the difference I mean, between... That's being being prepared, yeah. you know, because uh, when those situations do come along, yeah, you'll be glad you had it. It's a difference between just existing and being a little bit, having a little bit of your creature comforts, little, you know. <laughs> being a little bit of, you know, a little, little bit com comfortable. Yeah, know? yeah. And I just want to thank you guys. I see so many of you leaving messages that you've been praying from New Mexico, and we had people praying from the U UK and Australia and everywhere, and it was just, thank it was, you. yes, <laughs> that was really awesome, really, really awesome. So, but this is this is the kind of stuff that we educate on, and this is the kind of stuff that we encourage people to really embrace and think about. Even when you just go out for a short hike, you never know what can happen. And having the essentials, like I always, I have on our YouTube channel, just the little pack I carry and what's in it. That's those simple things can make the world of difference. And I encourage you to really consider that. And I know that uh, Meg also mentioned another uh, device that she uses. It's in here in the comments that you can look um, that she uses in in, uh, in place of the spot. It's good having those things. We we live out here and it's really vast, but if we get to the top of the mountain, oftentimes we can pick up a cell signal. So that, Sometimes. That's <laughs> right. And of course, when he needed it, he couldn't. So, you know, it is good to have those things and it is good to invest your money in things that are of importance. And like I said, we're frugal, but, you know, that's something that we're definitely going to invest in because so far on our travels out here, we've been pretty fortunate that we could get a signal somewhere for the most yeah, it part. It depends, depends on where you're at. Yeah. And um, you guys definitely survived the night. You didn't have to hold each other tight and stay warm, right? No. No. <laughs> I mean, uh, you could have done it without that, like that wool blanket. But, um, you know, that wool blanket was definitely a, a plus, a big plus. Um, so, you know, just having that little extra along, it sure didn't hurt. And being that we were in the canoe, um, you know, you could carry a little bit more. Something else, too, is with his shelter building. If you go to our YouTube channel, you can find a lot of the different shelters that we build um, out of materials in our surroundings, and that's pretty much exactly what you did. Well, I didn't go I didn't go into real a, a real crazy shelter because I basically just used a reusable space blanket and some plastic bags and, and that sort of thing because, you know, I knew we weren't going to be there for an extended period of time, so... You know, I wasn't, I was going to build something real elaborate, you know. But you did, you, you used I just the used tarp the space, space blanket, blanket and made a, a lean-to shelter type thing. And uh, we got in underneath there, had a nice cushion of moss and stuff to lay on. And, um, so, <laughs> hi doggy. Um, and have, uh, had laid plastic bags down and stuff. That way it kept the moisture off of us something that um you really want to be careful of when you're uh, when you're doing that because if you're laying on that cold ground 
to begin with, it's going to suck your body heat out, but then having moisture in there, um, you get yourself in big trouble there. Yeah, and fast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, and Annie Oakley mentioned that it must have been a really good bonding time for you and your dad, and that's something they both do, is they love the outdoors together in, in the same fashion, so I'm sure it was... It was, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was fun. We had it, we, you know... I mean, it wasn't like we were at a cabin somewhere and just hanging out, but, you know, we, we, we had a good time, and it was, you know, had we not been worried about them, it would have been, you know, been, been a lot better. If we were just out there camping, it would have been better, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, we had a good, good bonding time. It was a lot of fun. And something that you'll remember for a long yeah. time, as yeah. will we. I have to show you a little funny. He's out in the middle of the wilds. I love these things. This is an old insulator. It's the great blue green glass. And I want to use, I said I wanted one so I could put a tea light in there or a candle in there and have it burning. He finds this while he's out there along the side of the mountain and decides to go fetch it for me. I mean, is this a good guy or what? <laughs> oh, I just thought that was really funny. One, for... one thing I do want to say besides the insulator thing um, <laughs> uh, is something you want to definitely carry with you is some smaller trash bags and this is something I di have always done but um, I just want to share uh, smaller trash bags so I had hip boots but I also had other boots in the boat well my other boots ended up getting some water in them and so they were wet so you want to take if you have trash bags put them inside your boot and have some dry socks along and otherwise if your feet are wet and you got to walk like those boots ahead weren't really necessarily hiking boots mm -hmm. so and I had a lot of room in there so I was rubbing and me and my feet were wet end up getting blisters so anything you can prevent your feet from getting wet uh, will prevent prevent you from getting blisters and that so and just a heads up too, um, he came back and he had a blister the size, uh, probably a third of his foot was blister on the one foot. And we put lavender oil on that right away and that blister never popped. It's it's healed. It, it's, well, it's it's getting there, yeah. But it's, you know, it's so... a lot better than what it would have yeah. would have been had we not used that. Exactly. So, you know, having, uh, in my pack, I always have the essential oils and things, but, you know, to be able to come back and have the natural things to help heal you along the way is also good, and it's something as simple as lavender oil. But, um, Patty, Patty, uh, Kubaki said that my husband was telling me the whole time that Glenn knows what he's doing and he'll be fine, which mm -hmm. I agreed, but still, it was the worry, it was worrisome, and I hear that. 36 hours with no sleep and just the wondering, and you know, you did good while you were looking, but then you, and you try not to think, but the devil tends to sit on your shoulder when you're having, in these moments, he looks for any weakness, so it was hard, but it was, but it, I really had that overwhelming feeling that he was okay, it's just, I couldn't not be looking for him so you know we had to do our part and but um I wanted to mention this too if it was somebody that was less knowledgeable and prepared in the situation you were in what do you feel the outcome would have been in the area you were in it's vast folks well, it's vast it could have been a lot different of a story um had somebody not known you know for one, how to do some of the stuff on the river, um, and also how to take care of themselves and have the stuff to take care of themselves to set up camp and and that. I mean, it was it was raining off and on. It's been raining for a long two weeks. I mean, uh, just how, knowing how and where to find dry tinder and and firewood and and that sort of thing. Um, plays a big part. <laughs> it just makes me think. There was some. They were at the grocery store. Oh gosh, yeah. There was, there <laughs> was some guys. Crazy. It's been raining, like you said, almost two weeks. And then um, there were some guys buying firewood at the grocery store. The local grocery store had it out front and has some small <laughs> so things. They were done, <sighs> and they were saying, "Oh, we can't get a fire going in this wet weather." <laughs> well. 
you know, I couldn't help but those chuckle. Guys, <laughs> those type of people been in the same situation. Yeah. Um, would have been things stuck. could have been a lot, lot different I mean, because these... everything was soaked. And if you don't know how to do this stuff and don't know how to um, find these things, these resources and stuff, and I'm not trying to put those people down. Right. Um, I'm just trying to say, you know, hey, be educated, educate yeah. yourself on this stuff. Um, learn, learn how to do this stuff. If you're going to go out and you're going to get out there and do these things, learn this stuff. So you know what to do when it happens that's why you know i do things like we go out and we go out there a lot of times they're always saying man you're always trying to start a fire and and stuff well i'm i'm always trying new things when i'm starting a fire different scenarios different scenarios and stuff and Snow, I, I, I i play it out in my head and that's what you need to do because mm -hmm. when we got out there i knew what kind of uh branches small branches together and what kind of stuff you know um hemlock branches the get real fine a lot of the dead ones get real, real fine at the end well that's what's going to dry out the quickest is that fine material um so you know knowing that stuff yeah. is just something that you need need to do um yeah. if you're going to get out there and do this type of stuff that we were doing yeah. um yeah, because, you know, he takes us out, we'll go out in snow, we'll go out in rain, and we'll practice our fire-making skills. Because, you know, that's always a whole different scenario. And um, another friend of mine, you know, he works with the uh, search and rescue down in Colorado, back in the backcountry. And he said it really saddens him when they find people that are on snowmobiles even. You know, even you folks that want to go out in snowmobiles, he said it's so often that they find people on, you know, out with snowmobiles, end up stuck in the backcountry, and they find them dead. And they were trying to burn the contents of their wallet when right above them in the tree was lichen and different things that would have been useful to start a fire. It's just and you gotta you gotta think there too. Okay, with that situation, you're on a snowmobile. Okay, snowmobile. Even if you did run out of gas, you still have a little bit of gas in the bottom, the way the tanks lay and stuff. Um, oil. You have oil on your snowmobile. Um, you know, yeah. you have those things. But knowing what you're going to do before it happens is key. Key. That's what you yeah. you gotta you gotta think of this stuff and and plan for this stuff. Even if you don't ever have to use it, you know, at least be prepared because when you do run into situations like this, yeah. um, it's good to be prepared because things could have gotten a lot worse for yeah. somebody that wasn't prepared. Yeah. And it's kind of like riding a bike, you know, you learn these skills, they're in the back of your mind, you know, you might have to think a little bit, but, you know, they're there, and, and it's really worth the time to learn them, you know, because it's something as simple as breaking down, you know, in your car, in a, in a little bit of a remote area, you know, many of you might live in town, but you might be on the outskirts of town and break down, you know, out here we break down, and it's vast, and it's, it could be a long time till we see people, depending where we're at, so, you know, we, that's uh, why... Yeah, I'm so oh, sure. Go It's kind of, you know, there, where we had camped was up off the, the, I knew they'd be looking for us, you know, close to the water. That's another thing. You don't, unless you know how to get out of there, um, don't go walking off from where you, where you were, at least too far. Um, because if you go off too far and you don't have a clue where you're going um they're not going to know where to look for you they're going to be looking for you like here along the river yeah that's where they're going to be looking for you because that's where you were supposed to be right um if you just take off and just go walking um you know they're they're not going to have a clue where to look for you yeah so staying close to where you were you know yeah. Which is where we ended up. Um, hold on a second, our dog's getting. Come on. Get away from before you move the camera. <laughs> um, uh, stay close to where you are. That way, they they can find you. You know. Um, you know we we. I thought I knew kind of where it was, but I wasn't a hundred percent sure. 
and when we got out and come back in um, to get the canoe and everything, um, I knew pretty much where I was, basically where I had been in, in that area to a certain point. So I had I knew I was a general area, the general area. Yeah. Um, but it was what nine nine and a half miles back in back in off of the where we could have got to a person. Um, and there's out here there's logging roads everywhere, and they all go every which direction. Right. So you don't know you could come up on a logging road and oh it's a road great right. well. You start walking and you could walk 15 miles and all of a sudden, boom, hit a dead end. Yeah. You know, well, it's, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta think of this stuff. Yeah. So, so that puts you in a worse situation. You, yeah. One thing that I kind of thought of and it ended up being true as I was out there and we were walking up this, the mountain on a logging road to try and get cell service. Um, is on the logging roads you got to kind of try and think outside the box a little bit um the main logging road was coming in you know this way the other roads the spur roads were coming off the road like it's hard to explain in the camera but the road was coming towards me all the spur roads were coming facing back towards that road if that makes any sense so they're not going to have a log truck come in and have to go way down, turn around, and then come back in on it. You know, if they're once they to come in there, um, if that makes sense to you. Uh, so thinking of that thing, thing well, that's going to be the way out. You know, everything's pointing, it's almost like an arrow pointing out that direction. But yeah. you don't know how far out is. Right. So that's why you always want to stay with or close to where you where things happen. Something else he triggered in my mind when he's talking is, and, and I, I want to express that what he's talking about is when we went back in there, he and I went back in after they f were found, and he was checking to see that he was close to where he thought he was with the canoe, and when we went back in there, he recognized the road. you got to remember that what he's recognizing was from the dark. And this is something that's really important too. Daylight, dark, it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm really impressed because to remember that kind of detail and that from being in the dark is really huge to me. Um, in the daylight, you know, you want to notice your surroundings. You want to notice things you've passed so that you're not going in circles. And you want to you want to really pay attention to your surroundings, changes in your surroundings. That's something we always do. But for him to know that he was there and that where he went from there, and it was all had been. Uh, it had all transpired in the dark is really impressive to me to see that in the daylight and know you're where you were. I, um, we ended up, like I said, I had been back into a certain point, but beyond that point, I wasn't sure where we were. So, the friend that found us um, works with a guy off and on, and, and I've worked with him some. Um, he knew the area real well. And he took me back in there, and we were going back in. We hit that one point, and I was like, this is where we were. Um, yeah. It's like she said, just knowing, paying, paying attention, you know. And that also helps keep your mind off of, yeah. for some people, maybe the fear factor yeah. and um, the, the concern of being, you know, out there. Uh, just pay, pay attention to what things, like you're walking down the road, pay attention to, um, like the spur roads where we were in this example, um, you know, the spur roads, the road that I really recognized was we were coming down over this hill and the, there was a real sharp road off to the left, um, when we were coming in that curved down real hard and come back around, um, and just the way it laid going in, it was kind of sloped, and the way different things that were right there and right next to it was an opening. Um, mm. Just remembering that those things um, can make a big <coughs> difference, you know, yeah. of, of figuring out may, how to get out of areas or, right. you know, even <coughs> like in this situation, how to come back into an area. 
Thank you, Jess and Janet, by the way. And um, Annie Oakley has a really good response. She said, so would you say that if someone happens to get lost, you should wait until, day until daylight to try and move? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Great question, Annie. Um, because everything changes in the dark. Yeah. Um, the boogeyman comes out <laughs> in the dark. <laughs> um, you know, uh, just just things happen. You, you you see things that aren't really there. Um, I had a friend that was in uh, Germany on a SF course, and um, he was saying that the um, sergeant was telling him that he said, "You'll see things in the dark. You know, when it starts getting dark and stuff, you'll see things that." aren't really there. Like a stump starts looking like a person. <laughs> and then the next thing you know, a branch starts looking like a gun in that person's hand. You know, so you got to kind of, things just go totally different in the dark. So, you, you know, definitely just stay where you're at and yeah. set up camp, get as comfortable as you can, and don't wait till middle of the night to decide to get yourself set up because yeah. that means you're that much closer to daylight you're not probably going to get very good sleep then much sleep let alone good sleep um you know you, you're you're just you're asking for trouble if you wait too long you know you gotta you gotta make decisions educated decisions and think about it before it, you, it goes too long um because getting firewood I mean, I had that little Kershaw saw and the Wyoming pack saw. I didn't use the pack saw, I used the Kershaw saw. But, um, you don't want to expend a lot of energy doing that stuff. So what we did is we cut some chunks, big long chunks that were four or five foot long. Um, you know, big rounds that you could just, throughout the night, wake mm -hmm. up and push push the logs into the fire. And, and that's something. But you weren't sitting there sawing into the itty bitty pieces. Um, you don't want to expend that all that energy, and you know then you don't have the calories, the food right. to back up what energy you expended. Now, that makes me think of two things. Well, first I want to share what Jared said. Jared mm -hmm. says, "Can you imagine? Not all too long ago, husbands traveled for days, weeks away from home with zero way of <laughs> telling the family they were okay when they'd be home, etc. You know exactly. Yep. And then we're spoiled. You know." To, <laughs> All of us today are spoiled by technology. I mean, even me, I'm going to age myself, but when I was young and started driving, there weren't cell phones. So I often thought when, you know, when my son started driving, you know, how hard that had to be on my parents when I would go off driving and not have a means of communicating with them. You know, we get spoiled, and that was how it was <laughs> when we got here, too, and we set up camp, and we were living in the wall tent. You know, we had a bag phone that bounced off the repeaters. We had 15 minutes to use it because it was shared with the loggers. And, you know, so, so we were very limited. So I'd go out on runs with a gooseneck trailer to get materials, and he'd be here by himself working on the house. So he'd be worried about me. I'd be worried about him. You know, it's just, is that crazy? You it know, is, we're spoiled. We're yeah, spoiled. It is, it is funny, though, <laughs> with that, you know, comment, like I said, you know, people used to go out, you know, weeks on end, you know, and, yeah, they'll be back, you know. It's just funny how things have changed. <laughs> Jess says, Jess Knowles says, I hope, I hope you had your official tray or tool with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Krista said, that's why she has Seth get her out of the tree stand in the dark. Ha -ha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you yeah. know, you know, you, you learn as you go. It's, it is a learning process. And it's, to, to be honest, you know, with him going into uncharted territory the other day, I had no problem with that because... For us, we're both we both have the same mentality. We're both adventurers. He's a little bit more of a risk taker than I am, but a little. Okay, a lot. But <laughs> I mean, I'm well. For us, though, I mean, we're still way above the normal to get the two of us. Oh, you're above normal, all right. Anyway, <laughs> um, just knowing, you know, like we like to go out and and be that adventure and and go to the uncharted territory and ex you know exist in it. So. I don't want to take that away, you know, through this experience, I don't want that to change because that's part of our adventure and part of the fun. Don't worry, it won't. I know, don't worry. I'm not changing <laughs> it and I'm going with you next time. <laughs> I'm I'm actually, I'm really glad though that she wasn't um I was actually supposed to be there. Along excuse me because of her whole health. physical health, you know, yeah. situation. 
um, it was some rough country. Yeah. And it's good that, you know, it's probably good she wasn't along. Under normal circumstances, it wouldn't have been a problem. No. But my, but with the rain, my immune system is still impaired. And that's really what made me decide not to go is because for me to get sick right now would be really foolish on my part. So and that, that brings up another point. Okay. You know, if you are sick and you have problems, um, physical problems of, of whatever, you know, say uh, you have, uh, a diabetes, bad heart or yeah. diabetes or or you, you know that you have certain problems um don't put yourself in situations that like that problems can arise you know don't 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 put yourself if you know that you m might have to hike for miles and miles and miles and you're completely out of shape and you can't walk a hundred yards without almost dying um, don't put yourself in situations where you might have to walk 15 miles, 20 miles. You know, you, you don't want to put yourself yeah. out to dry. Be more conservative in your adventuring. And the other thing is, too, you brought up, you know, if you're on medication and you go out and you know that there's a potential that you might be out for several days, make sure you have your medication with you. You know, because you get out there in the wilderness like they did and you should have been home to take your next, you know, set of pills and you don't have them and it could be life threatening for you. You know, you got to you got to plan and think of all those things. And and many people don't. And that's why we push so hard with what we with what we do. Our YouTube channel is packed with all of this stuff that we do and we try to share it because it's not necessarily everybody's normal mentality. For us, that's how we grew up. We both grew up in the woods and we both grew up being the adventurers and and that. So no, I haven't I haven't made any videos here for quite some time, just things have been crazy. Um, but I'm hoping to get some more videos out, educational videos, and there's there's a lot of good stuff out there on the internet that you can yeah. check out, but there again, just checking these videos out mm -hmm. and not practicing, practicing the skills, it's not going to do you any good. If you don't know how to do it yourself, yeah, you can watch a video and, yeah. okay, yeah, this is what they did. Well, when things start happening and stress sets in, sets in um, it, 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 you forget. Totally different So if you're, if you're just start reacting on what you know and what you've done and practiced, it's not a big deal, yeah. you know. And people think that starting a fire is starting a fire. They think if you have a lighter you can start a fire but I encourage you if it is wet right now where you are go outside and try to start a fire it is not easy folks it's not easy and you have to know what you're looking for as far as where to find the dry tinder like you said before but I mean we, and, and we went out and he's well versed and it took him an hour one time to get a fire started because we were in we had gone out and it had rained and I rained and rained and rained and minimal yeah I had a uh, uh, minimal stuff yep and that was it was hard yeah so. You, but you, you, knowing where to find dry materials and that sort of thing, that was, that situation was a little different. We yeah. were trying. We were, we were pushing the envelope. And we were experimenting <laughs> with things. But knowing where to find certain materials and, and that sort of stuff is very important and know how to do it and not just say, okay, yeah, I watched the video, I can do that. Right. You know, knowing how to do that is a totally different ball game than actually doing it. Something else I wanted to mention too is staying calm. I know it's kind of been brought up a little bit here and there, but for both parties, we needed to stay calm because it wasn't beneficial to either one of us if we like spazzed out. For him, you know, it could have put him in a dangerous spot. And him spazzing out and freaking out is not a normal thing anyway. And, and it's not for me either. But where it helped me is, you know, you go in and you ask for search and rescue and you're like totally freaking out and totally beyond, you know, being contained. You're not helping your partner. You're not helping them because they're having to work with you first before they can go to look for him. You got to stay calm. Um, me going out there looking for him, you know, I could have gotten lost. I could have had issues too. But so, you know, you got to. That's, that's, that's another thing. Good uh, point. Yeah. You don't, don't. If you're going out looking for somebody, don't put yourself in a, in a situation. Spot. You know, yeah. she didn't really go far from the truck mm -mm. when she, when she was yeah. looking for me. So she had 
ways to get out and, and right. so on. But don't go out, especially in the dark right. and all that. Wait till daylight. As much as you would like to get to that person, going out in the dark is not a good idea. It's just, there, there's too many, especially along the water and in yeah. water oh, and gosh, stuff. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you can drive along the water and have a light and shine in the water and yeah. so on, you know, that's different. But to go out stumbling through rocks and stuff yeah. in the dark, you know, you're asking for trouble. Something else, too, is this is was a really important aspect, and this was kind of funny because we never anticipated this. I posted on Facebook for asking for prayers, and morning came and the sheriff's office phone was going off the ringer. I mean, it was just ringing nonstop because people wanted to go out looking for him. And they were upset because our friend did go out looking. Now, I have all the faith in Ryan. Ryan has the same skills Glenn does, so it wasn't in my mind. I was like, you know, he's fine, and I know he'll be okay. Um, but the thing is, is if you have a loved one that's missing, don't rally your friends and all start going looking because typically what happens is the people that are looking are less experienced than the one that's out there. And then you've got other deaths or issues or lost people on your hands. And that's why the sheriff was upset because they want to know where everybody is. When they set up a search and rescue, they start at one spot and then they dispense people and they know where everybody is and there's so usually, that they can, there's a protocol. Yeah, there's a protocol and there's usually some kind of communication device of some sort uh, with the different groups that everybody can communicate. Whereas if you don't have any means of communication, you know, well, this person go off and get lost, and then this person gets lost or whatever, and or gets hurt, and then there's a whole different, you know, then they're looking for that person. So you want to try and stay organized and stay together and stay, um, yeah, organized. Yeah, Jess Knoll said most most lost people just make matters worse. It's true, and and it's just a matter of uh, just a matter of really thinking. And, and staying calm and using common sense and sometimes you know that all three of those aspects can be hard I want to share something with you that he that he did while he was out in the wild what was the the tea you made oh uh, pine nettle tea that's a good calming uh, and it's, thing. it's it's high in vitamin C you know mm -hmm. and and we drank that right before we went to bed so it, you know it kept us warm got our core temperature up and and uh, the vitamin C helped us and you know, it's just knowing what you're gathering, gathering in, in those situations that you uh, have practiced that beforehand. You know, it's huge. Yeah, yeah. But is, do you guys have any other questions for us? We just wanted to share this with you because, honestly, we felt so blessed. I could not believe the outpouring of love that we were getting from everybody and how many of you that I work with that are on here with us we're sharing it and I mean that was just so overwhelming and just so wonderful and honestly it was a great distraction too and just um, a real uplifting when it was really hard for us ladies being home my mother-in-law is a sweetheart and and you know we both tried to stay strong but there were times we both weakened too you know I mean we're human and I'll be the first to say you know I cried you know I, I, I was concerned because you know that you get you hit a point where there's so many hours that they're missing and you just start thinking of all these things so to have that love coming in and just to know that we were being lifted that heavily because our God is so good he has been working so many miracles in our lives this year and it's just been awing to us because we've seen his hand so close to us and and just I, I, yeah I want to say thank you too to everyone that was praying for me and for her yeah. um, really Really appreciate that. It means means a lot. That's the best gift anybody could ever offer. So we really, really thank you. And if you guys have any other questions, you can keep them coming on this uh, feed here. All the comments that you place after this video is over, we will be notified so we'll know and we can continue to respond to them. <laughs> Just that I cried too. I was worried for both of you. Thank <laughs> you. I know it was really hard. <laughs> Yeah, it's real, and, and just we appreciate your love, and 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 like you said, he's gonna get some more videos out. I have one of his. Um, he was he was uh, harvesting our firewood, and um, we uh, did a video on that. I'm telling you, God has had His hand on us. That experience, this part of it was not videotaped, but when we were finished harvesting firewood at six o'clock that night and had three trucks full of firewood and we're coming down the mountain. 
I was driving the Mountain Boys truck because it um, was acting up on the top of the mountain, and on the way down, it, the brakes went out on me. We were three quarters of the way down the mountain, praise God. But, I mean, that's what I'm saying. God has had his hand on us. There have been things with my surgery, and, I mean, he hasn't done videos because he's been caring for me. It's been quite the year for us, but you know what? It is one of the best years I think we've ever had just in seeing God's hand in our lives and and our spiritual growth, too. So, you know, that's another thing. When you're out there, whether you are a believer or not, he's with you, and he will take care of you. And I know that through your prayers, you know, we had the ending that we did. So... Thank you. <laughs> and I think it's a good thing to say, you know, just because, you know, maybe the outcome would have, for whatever reason, been different. Um, you know, she said, God cares, you know. Well, just because the outcome's different doesn't mean that he doesn't care. Amen. Um, you know, I mean, you hear people saying, well, this person died, you know, why doesn't God... Why didn't God change that, or why? If he's a caring God, if he's why a did caring he? God, why did he let this happen? Well, it's not necessarily, you know, him not caring. It has nothing to do with that. Yeah. It's, it's how plan. life goes. I mean, a I mean, plan. his different plan, and and you know, you live and you die. It's just yeah. how it is. And it's People. also perspective. You know, I mean, I could be really you know, bitter because I've gotten sick and I've had to deal with all this this year. But you know what? I view my situation as though God is using me as a vessel to save other lives and to help people. And also, you know, even with my healing, you know, the more positive we are and the more happy we are, the better we heal. And, you know, I want to, I'm just grateful for all the happenings because we, did a video about my surgery and we've so far with people communicating with us we know we've saved 12 lives I'm sure we've saved others but through the communications we know for certain we've saved 12 and that that means so much to me you know I I'm willing to be a vessel for God to be able to help others come closer to him so it's all perspective and and he does care and he does love you so just thank you all so so very very much for your love your friendship your caring and your support and even more so your prayers yeah, is there um, any questions or anything that anybody might, I don't know. If yeah, if I see. missed some, I can see them. I'm scrolling up. If I missed any of your questions, you know, just feel free to retype it. Um, I think I got most of them. But we appreciate you. I know this was a long video, but I felt that we felt that this needed to be shared, especially with all of you reaching out and praying for us the way you did. Yeah, I think we... I think we covered all the questions. If not, if you want. Just let us know and put them in and we'll be glad to answer more questions. And if you need help with something or you are interested in learning something that maybe we haven't shared in, in detail. Yeah, I'm scrolling back down. I think it was Marla. Marla said, thank you for living a transparent life. You are both used for more than you can imagine. <laughs> and so glad everything turned out well. God bless you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But if there's things that we haven't shared in detail that maybe we mention in, in our videos or in passing or whatever in our posts and you want to learn more about the things we do, please don't ever hesitate to reach out to us. You can always email us at survive at treyerwilderness.com. Note there's a reason that that's in there because we make it a point to keep ourselves surviving. <laughs> but thank you all for joining us. We'll end this now. And you guys just take care and, and God bless. Yeah, God bless. And thank you all for the prayers. <laughs>